Hey, what's up, everyone? Before you start the prototype of your building, you first need to identify its occupancy, construction type, and fire and smoke protection requirements. This video will present these ideas through easy to understand colorful animations and drawings that you'll love. By the end of this video, you'll master the essential design principles that architects always use in their designs. For this one, we will focus on the origins of the International Building Code, scope and administration, occupancy, construction types, and fire and smoke protection. You can use these timestamps for your convenience. This video is part one of the video we released earlier. If you want to watch the full 35 minute video, you can click the banner or use the link provided in the description. Let's first talk about the introduction. Before, there are three building codes created by three different organizations. The ICBO made the Uniform Building Code, the SBCCI wrote the Standard Building Code, and the BOCA generated the BOCA National Building Code. These organizations decided to combine their codes to form a single unified building code, and that became the International Building Code. For this entire video, I'll refer to this as the IBC. These organizations are from the United States, and the IBC is a model code that each state in the USA refers to for their building code. Each state accepted the IBC and modified its parts to adapt to its state's unique design needs, such as climate, topography, and other considerations. The codes vary on the federal, state, and local levels. Let's think about the whole country first. Perfect example of the federal regulation all architects must follow is the ADA, or the Americans with Disabilities Act, written by ANSI. Now let's select one specific state. Since I live in California, let's pick this one. <laughs> Here. We use the CBC or California Building Code. This code is a modified version of the IBC to adapt to its particular conditions. Now let's pick one specific spot in California. Let's go to San Francisco. Here we can refer to the local building code. The San Francisco Building Code was derived from the local regulations from different sources such as agencies of hospitals, restaurants, and more. If the federal, state, and local codes are conflicting, follow the regulation with stricter condition. This way is a good rule of thumb to ensure you pick the safest option for the building occupants. There are also companion codes that you can use to complement the building codes you're using, such as the international zoning, mechanical, fire, and residential codes. All the building codes in the world dedicate at least a chapter talking about its administration, describing how the code should be applied. The typical coverage of this chapter are these factors shown. This chapter covers a project from the pre-design phase to construction administration. You may pause this video if you want to read further. Okay, let's talk about occupancy. The term occupancy refers to the building's type of use. I represented each occupancy with an icon for you to have an intuitive understanding of what kind of function each of them serves. Some of the occupancies are subdivided into more components and let me show you what I mean. For example, the assembly is further divided into five parts. The first pertains to assembly buildings with fixed seats, such as auditoriums and theaters. A-2 are cafeterias and casinos. A-3 are museums and lecture halls and so on. You can refer to the building code and read further about the examples of these. For those interested in reading the International Building Code, you can access it using the link I provided in the description below. The factory institutional, residential, and storage occupancies were also subdivided 
into particular components. You should also be aware of these particular considerations for each occupancy group. For example, in educational occupancy, one will consider a building or an interior space, an educational occupancy, if it serves more than six people at any one time for educational purposes through the 12th grade. Here are more considerations you should keep in mind. You can pause this video if you need more time to read each one of them. If you're a client or an architecture student, you might wonder why occupancies were divided into different groups. What basis did the writers of the building code use for this action? The occupancies were divided because of these three main reasons. Combustible content, fire hazard, and life safety factors. In essence, occupancies are classified by how hazardous a particular occupancy group is compared to the others. There are also particular requirements for these occupancies. You'll find these requirements in Chapter 4 of the International Building Code. By determining the occupancy first, you'll perform the next steps to comply with the building code and do these things. Let's take a quick pause. If you're having fun watching this video, you can like, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell. These simple acts will help this video reach more people and help them learn. If you're curious about our future content, you may also use the link we provided in the description to access and learn what video we're developing. Cool! Now we're ready to discuss different construction types. The buildings you've visited your entire life are made of other occupancies and classified into different construction types. The first is Type 1. This type is made of concrete construction and its main structural elements are non-combustible. Non-combustible are materials that are not flammable. Type 1B is made of protected steel construction and its main structural elements are non-combustible, like Type 1A. The word protected means that the steel members used for this type of construction are insulated. These insulations protect the steel from possible damages that the fire could inflict. The structural elements of the exterior walls of Type 2A are made of concrete or masonry with its roof, joists, and beam unprotected or uninsulated. On Type 2B, the walls and roofs are composed of unprotected or uninsulated structural elements. The construction types from 3A onwards are made of combustible materials. These types can catch fire and can burn quickly. Type 3A comprises of floors, walls, and roofs that are combustible but are treated with one hour fire resistance. This means that these building elements can prevent fire from spreading to adjacent spaces for one hour. Type 3B is almost the same as Type 3A, except that the floors and roofs don't have a fire rating. From Type 4, construction onwards, this is where wood materials come into play. The exterior walls are made of joisted masonry, while the interior is made of heavy timber. Type 4 can be called millwork construction. Type 5A is a wood frame building where all building elements have a 1 hour fire rating, except interior walls that are non-load bearing. Type 5B is also a wood frame building, but its building elements don't have fire ratings. So what did you notice as we transition from construction type 1A to construction type 5B? This might seem obvious for some architecture students and professional viewers, but for the laypeople, clients, and young students out there, what did you observe? I was hoping you could think about it for a while. You may pause this video to take your time. As we go along from 1A to 5B, we approach a more hazardous construction type. I made this illustration to summarize the things I discussed a few moments ago. 
as you recall, types 1A and 1B, are considered non-combustible, and I colored them green. From type 2A onwards, I put the orange shade to present these types' vulnerability on fire. The only exception for this one is type 4, which breaks the smooth transition from green to red, since this type can hold up well on fire compared to types 5A and 5B. Let's talk about fire and smoke protection. Architects cannot design fireproof buildings, but they can create buildings with the ability to resist fire. There are two classifications of fire resistance. The first classification is a material or an assembly's fire resistance. The building assemblies shown must have a specified hourly fire resistance rating according to ASTM E119. If you have a particular fire barrier in a room, any building components that penetrate it must have a fire rating as well. Determining these ratings is essential for knowing what specific construction type an existing building falls into. This doesn't mean each member of a particular building assembly is standalone fire rated member. Let's take this suspended ceiling as an example. Each one of these members isn't fire rated on their own. The combination of these members results in a suspended ceiling that's fire rated. The second type of fire resistance classification is the building's finishing. Finishings are rated by ASTM E84. This type aims to moderate the amount of combustible finishes in a building and control the fire spread rate. When dealing with fire and smoke protection, you'll encounter these four words. So what's the difference between these words? A fire partition is used to separate gas rooms for R-1, R-2, and I-2 occupancies, different rooms in dormitories, apartments, and assisted living area, lobby partitions, partitions for each tenant in a covered mall, and corridor walls. Fire barrier are used as separators for mixed-juiced occupancy, enclosure for stairways, separating a single occupancy room from a fire area. Firewalls are used to separate different construction types, while a smoke barrier can be a horizontal or vertical membrane that restricts the movement of smoke. This is the end of part 1. Now, you have a pretty good grasp of where the IBC came from, building occupancy, construction types, and how to protect buildings from fire. In part 2, I'll show you the essential relationship between these factors and the building's height and area. This graph will unify the relationship between these factors and show you the organizing design principle when designing any building. If you want to learn and access the content we're currently developing in advance, you can use the link in the description. If you loved this video, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell to keep updated on our future videos. I would also love to see your thoughts by commenting on this video. All comments will get a response from us. You may also share this video with your friends whom you think need it. If you want to learn more about Orcashare, you may visit orcashare.com and support us. See you on part 2.